Uh, uh, welcome to this information science department's distinguished guest lecture. Uh, this is from College of Computing and Inf Informatics at Drexel University. Today, we are very pleased to have the distinguished guest, Marsha Jen, who come here to, here to talk about data. <laughs> we just mentioned about lab data. So let me uh, introduce uh, Marsha first. Marsha has a PhD from School of Computing and Information at University of Pittsburgh. Marsha has done a lot of things. I, uh, she's a leading expert and international leader in uh, standard developments, vocabulary, uh, standardization, terminology service. I just mentioned a few of uh, things here, like ANCOS, Network Knowledge Organization. This, uh, this is one of the things uh, Marsha was involved from the very beginning. Until now, I see the website, if we click on that website, you will see that it's here from Kent State, from Marsh, Marsha's webpage that she has continue to maintain a very good website with a lot of presentation papers related to network knowledge organization or ANCOS. Uh, Marsha is also an expert in uh, very active in International Society for Knowledge Organization, ISCO. She served in multiple positions, including executive board of that society and many other positions, very active there. The other thing, perhaps a lot of us are more familiar is the Dumpling Core a Metadata Initiative, DCMI. Again, Marsha is start from the very beginning, very active, serve in many positions in the organization. And one of champion uh, behind this organization for, for the Dumpling Core, particularly making the Dumpling Core go out of the library, not just in, 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 in library and a lot of other applications. We all know about ACES, the, the American Society for Information Science and Technology, or well, it's not American, it's an inter, uh, international um, association. Mm -hmm. association of the Society of Information Science and Technology. She served uh, again, many positions in the organization, including board of directors, chair of standards committee, and many others. She's also active in high school, and currently she's a chair of digital humanity curriculum committee, working on digital, human digital humanities curriculums. And there's a lot more. I particularly like these uh, acronyms as that, that seem to be the kind of standards she's working on in ISO for uh, W3C Special Library Association, IFLA, and, and many of these organizations. I should mention uh, a book, a very popular book, uh, just called Metadata. If you learn metadata, you're likely need to see this uh, book. Currently, it's already in the second edition, very popular, and its third edition is coming up this year. I believe Marsha can talk about that later on. So a lot of schools, LIS schools using this book, uh, cover the metadata, and we, of course, that's not just the only book. She has published five books and more than 100 uh, research papers on that. In, this, in addition to that, she also uh, very busy in giving speech in many different areas. So we are very glad that we'll get her here. For example, she have just give a keynote at the Digital Humanities Summit at, uh, and then another international conference on digital archive and digital humanity in ta uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, give uh, a, a keynote speak at the Gettys, Getty Center. Uh, I think she, she has been working with Getty Center for many years uh, uh, on control of uh, 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 these projects. 
So yeah, they are continue. Uh, they, these are just at least a uh, current uh, few years. Uh, that we, I know that uh, she has traveled a lot, including you know, here say Taiwan, China, a, a, a lot of place giving a speech uh, on this topic. Finally, I should mention, we also have a special guest here, Ima. Ima Saberas. <laughs> uh, she uh, she has worked closely with Marsha, and particularly Marsha will talk on the, the collaborative project they have been working together. So we're glad to have Ima here today as well. So with that introduction, let me give the floor to Marcia. Like Marcia now is currently in Kent State. Hi, Marcia. Hi, Welcome. everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for coming. It is a great honor to be invited to this as a guest speaker at this very special event this very special week, right? Uh, we all have our passion to work together for the open science, open data, and also the power of data and information in this digital age. Um, so I hope that through this lecture, you get some um, ideas about the adventure that I had with Yima together in the new era of the open science and open data. Um, if we have time, we can discuss more after this. And also I would be glad to keep continue all the conversation. This session will share the research findings and the pilot study on ensuring the fairness of metadata here, FAIR is F-A-I-R. The open data and open science environment requires the published digital resources are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, FAIR. The principles refer to three types of entities, including data or any digital object metadata, that information about that um, digital object, and infrastructure, the three types of entities. In this session, the focus will be on metadata. After an introduction of the FAIR principles, the presentation will report the new efforts of the agris which is a global public service provided by the FAO of the UN. We will first have some background about open science. Open science is the movement to make scientific research and its dissemination accessible, accessible to anyone at any level. So this uh, scientific research include publications, data, physical samples, and software. Usually open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. Plan S is uh, the one that address the open access part. This is an initiative for open access publishing that was launched in September 2018. The plan is supported by a lot of international consortiums and research funders, which requires that um, with effect from 2021. All scholarly publications on the results from research funded by public or private grants 
provided by national, regional, and international research councils and the funding bodies must be published in open access journals on open access platforms or made immediately available through open access repositories so we can see that kind of requirement is now coming. The United States Federal Data Strategy has released for a while, and we will later check the USA's data.gov website, which provides thousands of data sets. And a new resources, um, it's a resources.data.gov was also launched uh, in 2019. That is an online repository of policies, tools, case studies, and other resources to support data government management exchange and the use through the federal government. So in the open science and the open data movement, how can we make sure that we all meet certain principles? So this fair principles are very important and widely used. The first step in using and reusing data is to find them. And you can see the principles refer to three types of entities, data or any digital object. And then second one, metadata, which is information about that digital object. And third, infrastructure. Sometimes you can see the, the word spelled out as metadata um, in parentheses, which means for both data and metadata. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both humans and the computers. Machine readable metadata are essential for automatic discovery of data sets and services. So this is an essential component of the whole process. Once the user finds the required data, then the user needs to know how this can be accessed. So this uh, accessible requires data and the metadata are retrievable by the identifier using a standardized communications protocol. Then metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. This is very, very important. The data usually need to be integrated with other data. In addition, the data need to interoperate with applications or workflows in the analysis, in the storage, and in processing. Therefore, data and metadata must be interoperable. So those details give us the guidelines of how to reach the interoperable data and metadata. Reusable, the ultimate goal of FAIR is to optimize the reuse of data. You don't want to just create data silos, right? To achieve this, metadata and data should be were described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. This R1 uh, is directly referred from the first findable principle. As you can see, the findable F2 refer defined by the R1 below. So the reusable directly connected with that. 
this is summary of the fair principles. We will take some examples to show the new opportunities at the open science movement. You can see the fair principles and the importance of metadata enable we see all of this and take the new opportunities. First, we can see a few examples of the tools developed. The Dataverse project is an open source web application to share, preserve, cite, explore, and analyze research data. It has been implemented by a lot of different institutions all over the world. Each Dataverse collection contains data sets. And then each data set contains descriptive metadata and data files. So if it's a organizing um, way that data first collections may also contain other dataverse collections. DCAN it's a community driven free and open source open data platform that gives organizations and individuals ultimate freedom to publish and consume structured information. Pay attention to the term structured information, mainly the metadata. And this is very popular and has been used by data.gov and many US government agencies. Open data provided by agencies are usually research based with high quality and very well documented with rich metadata, as we will check later from some examples. And they usually provide the available data sets through dedicated web services. They have their own web services. We mentioned that the tool DCAN, this is the US Department of Agriculture used the DCAN to provide its services, dedicated services. I have some numbers to show you how quickly it was growing. This is from the healthdata.gov another one federal government website managed by the US Department of Health and Human Services. And you can see the filters by content type data sets, right? And topics. Also look at the formats. Very, very complicated, much more complicated than the normal metadata repository or catalogs. The previous example was agent provided. Now we're talking about putting all this agent inventory together, uh, centralized. The example here is data.gov, the USA central clearing house to research and discovery. Data.gov was launched by the US General Services Administration, GSA, in uh, about May 29. At that time, there were 47 data sets. And very quickly, it's now it has grown to over 200,000 data sets. Uh, 
can see the organization types, where the data come from. They could from federal agencies, could from states, counties, and cities. I also would like you to check the format. A long list, it's much, much more complicated. Think about how to handle and provide access to this huge and complicated uh, data sets uh, resource. When you go inside, for example, check the Department of Agriculture, how many data sets provided. Yeah, 1.8K. It's, but it's uh, from where? Again, there are categorizations you can check by the sources as well as the data set type and the resource type. Similar to the data.gov that we just talked about in the USA, there is a similar one in UK. And the portal is a find open data. It has different categories. For example, I chose environment, which tells you what are the coverage. And then uh, by just recently, there are over 7,000 available. The European Union Open Data Portal has a very nice interface. You can check by themes. So I click on the agriculture, fishes, forest, and food. And nearly a thousand data sets found. And I want you to pay attention to the example of particular data set. You see I put in the bottom part. In addition to download with different ways, it also allow you to see the visualization results. Open data centralized can also be in the way of digital repositories. In fact, this is a pioneer project and was led by our professor, Jane Greenberg. It was funded in the 2012 a pioneer work funded by the NSF. If you go to the website, you can see that was used by all of the world and in many different domains. It makes the data online scientific publications discoverable, freely reusable, and citable. It is a general purpose home for a wide diversity of data types. Open Air is also a huge repository. It's a European project supporting open science. They provide a technical infrastructure harvesting research output from connected data providers. Seeing the new opportunities in the open science movement. What will you do? The next we will focus on the average efforts of integrating research data sets, metadata. AGRIS is the International System for Agricultural Science and Technology, a global public service provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations. Agris can be seen from three point of view, a network, a database, and a web portal. As a network, 
it has over 450 institutions in the 150 countries contribute to this. The providers could be a variety of uh, types of uh, providers. It's a database. This is uh, our most interesting part. It has millions of structured bibliographical records um, since 1974. And it, it's multilingual, it has users from all over the world, especially the third world countries. The openness and the flexibility of the web have created both new opportunities and new challenges for data publishers and data consumers. Where are we? Are we data publishers? Are we data consumers? The how to represent, describe, and make data available by publishers in a way that it will be easily found, understood, used, and reused by consumers. The next step to include the research data sets services, maybe one of the ways to provide links for accessing the data sets, portals, and services for all the food and agriculture and other themes from all over the world. That means you on the web page provide links to data.gov, provide links to data.gov.uk, etc. Another option is like those. Open data provided by centralized way. Starting a big service like data.gov for food and agriculture. That means you harvest all the metadata from the world and become an independent service parallel to the existing bibliographical um, algorithms. Would that be workable? Another option is to extend the existing algorithms integrating the research data sets, metadata. You can see the current one, uh, when you check content type, it has bibliography, book, conference, journal article, thesis, and other. Can we extend this and integrate research data sets here? This option led to a new effort with a pilot project. It was aimed to extend the existing algorithms to integrate research data sets, metadata. So you are not only searching by publications, you can also search by data sets. And the metadata considerations will be um, needed, uh, I will talk about this next. In this pilot project, it started with the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture uh, from the National Library, National Agriculture Library. Through their open research data uh, services, through several steps. First, we have to find out what's there. So analyze data sets and metadata by going there and check what are available and what are provided. This was done in the 2019. There are two sections. The when you 
search and find any metadata. First is basic metadata. So we got all the ideas of what is data, what's the spatial geographical coverage, what are the uh, owners and the participators, and where you can get the full data. This is uh, basic metadata. There is also extended metadata, which gives you a lot more details. All of the metadata records are also stored as JSON files. We analyze metadata. We first check what elements are used in describing, documenting the data sets. On the left side, they are presented in the main parts. Then I can also see the details, open each of the parts that can be contained the sub parts. You see that corresponding element. Then we would take a look at the structure, not just the element name. Why? Because each element on top level can be open with subset, but there could be the same element name. For example, I check this one called food and the nutrition assistant research database. When you look at the distribution, this database can be distributed, downloaded from different URLs, maybe have different names, but they all have the element called a title. And when you search title, what do we mean? We need to understand the structure. The analysis then goes on to the data values. For example, in the keywords section, it contains very rich themes and taxonomy data values. The sources could be different thesaurus, could be a ISO standard could be a taxonomy. If I go on, let's see how complicated in the JSON file. The USDA has done excellent job. You see, for example, when we continue to look at the data values, you see that full taxonomy has been applied at all levels, from kingdom to species, in the original metadata records. Wow, so impressive. A spatial element can contain simple, like this one, or very comprehensive geodata values. You see the spatial column on the bottom one and the right one. Wow, very impressive again. The next analysis is the metadata schemes used. The USDA JSON scheme is based on what we call Project Open Data Metadata Scheme version 1.1, which is based on DCAT. So you can see the relationship, Dublin Core, DC there. And then DCAT is the data catalog vocabulary of the W3C itself is an application profile of Dublin Core. Then the Project Open Data Metadata Scheme ODMS is based on the DCAT uh, 2014 version and it's, it's used by the USDA. 
after all of this analysis, it led to the step B, mapping based on metadata schemes. The involving schemes, we mentioned about that, uh, what Agris used, which is the application profile of Dublin Core. And then the USDA JSON files use, they use the one based on the project open data metadata scheme, which itself is the DCAT application profile. And DCAT was built also based on Dublin Core and extended to cover research data. Well, I won't go into the detail, just want to show you on the left side is uh, Agri's own application profile, Dublin Core based, and lots of elements. And DCAT uh, led to the project open data metadata scheme that used by the USA government and by this uh, we can see that come from DCAT, and DCAT came from Dublin Core. Yeah, on the left side is the DCAT uh, 2014 edition. You see a lot of starting with DCT. Um, that this is from Dublin Core. Okay. So, can we map? Yes, because they all have the basic route together. Um, so we try to focus on achieving interoperability at the level of schema, at the level of records and the repository, and think about possibilities and how uh, you can accurately do this and whether you really need to crosswalking the mapping everything they have to be realistic the lower part was the spreadsheet uh, created to compare and crosswalk the different schemes that used this is just uh, informational uh, slides i compiled this marked what the new DCAT 2020 version uh, mainly uh, created. You probably have seen the ACES webinar on the DCAT ontology. This was still fully compatible with the DCAT version one that we talked about in the previous slide. This M2B also now need to modify the consideration and to include the both bibliographic and the research data. This will be ensuring its interoperability to support the management and access of bibliographical plus research data. You have to go to your original structure and modify the application profile and um, then implement into the database and the harvesting use. The fourth step is metadata integration. So the data now validated and mapped and cleaned up and converted to the Agris application profile. And then enriched with the uh, element and values that are uh, used by the Agris then convert into Agris RDF data. This is the final uh, effort. After the pilot study,
converting, uh, cross walking, and they started to harvesting. What are the outcomes? In the May of uh, 2019, after the pilot study, the new effort has resulted in a new function which enables users to search for over 1,500 open data sets through Agris. Now, when you go to search the Agris, you can see the filter, not only publications, but also data sets. When you search that, um, for example, when I search the food, I can decide whether I want to data set or want publication or both. And this led to all the downloadable data sets where algorithms provide is access to the data sets. So the metadata from the USDA was integrated here and then the access through the USDA metadata to reach out. What about if I want to get the metadata? You access there the source brought you to the USDA to the particular provider and where you can uh, find the information and download and use from there. Okay, understand that website is Agris, give the access to the USDA data. Okay, let's wrap up and check what are the major takeaways from this pilot study in this open science movement. The major takeaways from this pilot study at the Agris is that it's time to provide metadata for open data through existing services existing bibliographical portals uh, services like Agris. Here interoperability is the key to all these possibilities. For a metadata framework, ensuring interoperability is fundamental. A apply the um, Appropriate crosswalking models and method will ensure the reusability of data, including metadata. And also, reusable metadata and data enable extended findability of open data. So, though fair. Thank you so much for coming to listen to this long session with a lot of details. Uh, you can follow the references and suggested tools, websites, services, and cases to explore and try to implement the FAIR principles in your future research and development. Here are some of the references. Um, you pay attention to the new Load BD third edition that we just released in December 2020.
2020, which included the implementation of a DCAT uh, for research data, as well as this crosswalk with the schema.org. There are more references here. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Marsha. Are you live again? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, well, just uh, thank you, Marsha, and also Emma. We know you've made really important contributions to this work, too. And you and uh, Marsha have a, a long, long-standing collaboration. Um, I think I know a lot of people on this list, but not everyone. So I'm just saying, hi, I'm Jane. I'm a professor in, in the uh, information science department. And um, I think probably everyone knows Ja. He introduced Marsha, but I just wanted to give a nod out to Ja. He's the department head of the information science department. Um, Marsha and Emma, you guys are both showing your screens. I hope so people can see you. That's great. Um, there's a lot of people, so I can't see everyone at once. Um, but we, um, we're going to open this for questions now. And it's just uh, very, very thoughtful work. Um, a lot going on. Um, yes. OK, so we have a question. And I guess uh, I'll, I'll do my best to monitor the um, Slack and, and look for people's hands. But if I, if I don't get your question, somebody else, feel free to bug me or whatever. So um, I saw you already answered, Marsha, about making the slides available. Um, so we have um, a question from uh, Danuta Nataki, our, our Dean of our Libraries. Um, are you aware of any projects using, using um, projects working to integrate FAIR principles in, um, or to link the discipline or the political politically organized platforms? Marsha? Okay, first, uh, um, I will share the slides with you all to, so you can maybe check by yourself. Uh, FAO's Agris has a new interface, uh, a lot more data sets already integrated. Um, maybe if you have the technical questions, the Yima could help and Christine also here. Oh, <laughs> Christine, yes, yes. Yeah. But yeah. Marsha, the question is projects mm -hmm. working with FAIR yeah. Uh, to link any discipline or politically organized platforms. Are you aware of anything like that? Uh, it's uh, the, the best examples are the data.gov and racial.data.gov that probably toward this. So you, if you read that strategy, okay. um, it will be helpful, right? And do, does Emma or Christine want to add anything there? No, I think that much I covered pretty well. Good, good. All right, next question. Um, could or should data that contains some confidential information be made somewhat fair, such as trade secrets, et cetera, so that at least they are discoverable as existing? I uh, haven't read any specific things like that. <laughs> Maybe it's your project to do, right? Yeah. Any, um, it's a very else? good question. Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. Uh, you can see even in the examples we showed, those data has different levels of accessible whether you can access or you can download or you can reuse all different degrees. But I yeah. think that probably uh, there's some way you can combine with the, all those more confidential information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have the other percentage. I mean, I'll just chime in that yes, FAIR does apply to sensitive and restricted data. So you can have the metadata about the data, but not necessarily the data. <laughs> um, so, um, but it's, it's great. All right, uh, so next question is, 
Do you have any examples of the 1,528 open data sets that are being used about how people are writing papers or using the data? Maybe I'll even annotate using or reusing. The Ima maybe got. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, Ima, you unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, I was answering something about Elise on the chat. Sorry for that. Um, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure, sure. Emma, the question is um, the 1,528 open data sets that are being used. Um, do you have examples of how they're being used or reused, like writing papers um, about data use? How, how's it working? Uh, no, no, we don't have this kind of uh, information. Um, this, um, we are only facilitating visibility and accessibility through our website. So anything that has to do about the usage of the data sets needs to be a little bit followed up through the original, the source website. Yeah. So yeah. where the data set is stored. Yeah. What we can give is, is statistics about how often people are attracted by the metadata that describe this data set and they end up in address and then they link to the website where the data set is available. This we can do, which is also an interesting information, but we cannot give uh, more information than that with um, with the data that we are storing, actually, yeah, mm -hmm. I would su I would suspect with um, you know publications and citing the data, eventually you can do probably some kind of checking, you know, with if the the data is recited or something, in a publication. But that, like you said, that's future. Um, yeah. that's excellent. Let's see, uh, lots of lots of good questions here. Um, I, I'll just say, we're going to collect all the questions, everyone. So if your question doesn't get answered, we're going to make sure that they get to everyone, um, uh, Emma and, and Marsha. So, all right, the next question is, uh, is there an effort to use this to gather all the research being done to fight COVID? COVID-19. Yeah, I see Kirsten and uh, Emma uh, did a presentation at the Dublin core about how they immediately integrated the this terms in the agribook in order to include the, the COVID-19 fighting uh, information. So Kristen, you- Yeah, Kristen. Um, yeah. Of course, we had uh, coronavirus and more generic uh, when we know, no, no one saw this coming. So uh, we had a question from IFPI early on last year asking us to include COVID-19 because it's not just a public health issue, it also impacts market access, food security. And there's a lot of experience made in the past on diseases like Ebola and Zika that are actually transferable in the food security and other context. So it's definitely being used of course, especially in the health sector, but also in terms of um, socioeconomic impact and in making that data visible and accessible to people so that the keywords are essential. So we've expanded to much more related keywords beyond the purely um, COVID related. So Emma, do you want to add anything? Right. Um... Yeah, no, well, we tried to harvest data based on COVID-19 uh, during the last year and to populate uh, with more interesting publications uh, related to the pandemic. But it was uh, pretty difficult for us due to the fact that there was a lack of uh, assessment in terms of, so some terms assessed in vocabularies used out there. So Agrivog was quite, quite uh, fast uh, adding these, um, these keywords. We tried to do our best, but at that time was um, still a bit, little bit too early for us to start uh, harvesting based on Agrivog keywords to make sure that the data that we were putting in was, um, um, yeah, was pertinent to the COVID-19. This is something that we would like to assess in 2021. Perhaps uh, there is a little bit more of coherence out there using the Agrivoc new terms. Um, and maybe there are some uh, data providers uh, 
suitable for agri-is that are already using this kind of um, keywords. We try to harvest using as much control vocabularies as possible and not using natural language before um, uh, we, uh, there is an effort. This I can assure. It was last year from the agri perspective and agri and what we hope is that this year we are going to be a little bit more effective and, um, and showing more results. Thank you. And we um, need to emphasize this is multilingual. So every term you yeah. add, you make sure that the, you, the UN official languages are there as well as uh, the inclusive of other languages. So Christine has been doing a lot of work to make sure the multilingual um, accessible to this team effort. It's a great network. It's fantastic. I mean, the, the work that has come out of the FAO, FAO um, it, in terms of metadata and ter terminologies and so forth is, is, a, is a role model for the yeah. world. I would like to add that we have another team member here uh, from FAO, which is Ilkay Holt. She's uh, oh. hiding somewhere, but um, yes, oh. here she is. She's what she's, she's yeah, she's Agris and Kristen is Agravog. So we have a good representation here today. Well, fantastic. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of challenges with COVID, but the fact that we can have this distinguished guest and all of you as distinguished guests in my, in my mind, um, and I think everyone else's, uh, and, and have international participation and, and, and learn uh, about the work and the efforts you are leading is just really, really fantastic. Um, we are a bit out of time and I see some people are saying they need to run. Um, there's questions about the ePrint repository and theoretical frameworks and folks, and I've saved your questions. Um, and what we generally do when we have a distinguished guest is we get them here, you know, and we get them for the day and we get to have lunch with them and you get the doctoral students and other students get to meet with them and ask questions. And we're not doing that. <laughs> but um, we will arrange some uh, follow up, either an online Zoom chat session and then um, Ilka and Emma and Kristen and Marsha could maybe we can make you all accessible or or we're just going to have to do something like have the rda main conference in philadelphia again and get you all to visit our great mm -hmm. city again um i know that uh some of you go back a ways i see jay's comment about the um elis repository from 2003 it's really lovely to keep these connections going and um just an honor for us at drexel to have you all share and marcia Thank you for this really very thoughtful presentation. I have questions for you too about schema.org, but I will follow up. Um, so we're a little over time. Um, and I think uh, I see people smiling. So maybe it's time to give a, a nice applause and um, folks carry on their way. Um, I see 